What is the technology strategy for the U.S. Small Business Administration, SBA? How is it using technology and innovation to change the way it does business? And how has SBA adjusted its operations to meet the demands of its pandemic recovery mission? I'll explore these questions and so much more with our very special guest, Sanjay Gupta, Chief Technology Officer at the Small Business Administration. I was wondering about your specific duties and responsibilities as the Chief Technology Officer at SBA. Can you tell us more about those responsibilities and perhaps you could outline for us the portfolio under your charge and how it supports the overall mission of SBA? Absolutely. Yeah. So as the SBA's Chief Technology Officer, I'm responsible for the overall technology strategy that enables the SBA mission. Now, part of it includes, obviously, IT modernization and innovation that specifically helps in delivering the SBA's mission. So as an example, I've had the opportunity to increasingly leverage artificial intelligence and machine learning solutions in two broad domains, and more specifically, their relevance has only become more important in the last year and a half plus uh, as part of our COVID-19 response. So... Let me give the perspective of the program side first, and then I'll talk about the cybersecurity side. So on the programmatic side, we increased and accelerated the use of algorithm-based decision support systems. Uh, Given the volume of applications for loans and grants that we have been processing, it was only important for us to be increasing the use of these solutions that have allowed us to increase our throughput. And then on the cybersecurity side, I had the opportunity to implement SBA cybersecurity vision, and I'll talk more about it later. But part of that portfolio has been the use of artificial intelligence and machine learning, and more specifically, anomaly detection capabilities. And those, again, have been immensely beneficial to us, specifically in the last year and a half plus, uh, as all of us, or most all of us, have been working in a virtual environment. And that has obviously changed the landscape from a cybersecurity standpoint. So it's been about new innovative solutions, implementing them at scale, and that's all part of my portfolio. A couple of the things I want to kind of also highlight here is in the last year and a half plus, we've had an overwhelming reach out by the vendor partner community to the SBA, each of them offering their help and support. And this was anywhere from a Fortune 50 company to an early startup. So I've served as a point of contact for these outreach, and it has had really two benefits uh, at a broad level. First, I was able to reach out, connect with these individuals, and spend at least 30 minutes with each of them to hear them out in terms of what their product and service solutions are, or what is it that they were proposing to help SBA with. Second, it was also helping me learn more about what the state of the art of the nature is from a technology standpoint. And of course, it did help our program leadership to focus on their program delivery and not be distracted by this. And I've had more than 100 plus such uh, outreach calls in the last uh, year and a half plus. And so that's been a very, very uh, invigorating experience for me as well. Two final points uh, as part of my portfolio is I'm leading a cyber innovation team, which is comprised of a few CTOs and chief information security officers or CISOs, uh, which is broadly around the mandate to say, how can we come up with new innovations in the cybersecurity domain, which can be applicable across the federal landscape? And finally, I'm also a board member of the Technology Modernization Fund, uh, which as you may know, was you know, funded with 1 billion in the American Rescue Act uh, in, in March of 2021. So I have a kind of a broad portfolio of things and, and I'll talk more about it as we go along here. Yeah, well, thank you, Sanjay. I mean, that was a great uh, response. I was wondering, given such a, an important portfolio, given the fact that we're in sort of whatever we want to call, whatever the cliche is of today, the next new normal, the, the new normal, if you will, um, I was wondering, what are your top management challenges uh, that you have faced and how have you sought to address those challenges? Yeah, another great question, Michael. The top two or three management challenges that I see people around budgets and contracting and acquisition. So on the people thing side, we have really two key challenges. One, the skills and competencies do not match the skills and competencies that we need for today's modern technologies. Second, we do not have enough resources to go around or just purely in terms of numbers, the number of skilled resources or even just resources we have is not 
adequate to the demand that we're supporting. First and foremost, we've made increased availability of training, especially in new technologies like cloud and cloud foundations and data and cybersecurity in a cloud environment. Second, we've increased our leverage of using contractor resources where it has been possible and it has been appropriate. Third, we've uh, had a major initiative around workforce where we have defined new career paths and specifically focused on the technology workforce and helping them see how they could choose a career path which will allow them to grow uh, from a technical standpoint, but also from a managerial standpoint. And last but not the least, uh, I recognize that there are programs like the Presidential Management Fellows Program or the PMF program that you can tap into to get resources. Granted, they are only there for a short period of time, like six months, nine months, or a year program. But still, you have a resource available, some smart individuals who can help you and augment your workforce. So, so those are the things that I've used from a people standpoint. The second domain I talked about was budget. You have to start looking for what I call as cost savings opportunities. I know what to look for opportunities for cost savings. And to be able to realize them and use those funds to be able to divert towards some of your modernization or innovation initiative. And that's what I've done uh, here at the SBA as well. So it comes down to understanding how the budgeting process works in the federal world, which is, as I learned very quickly, uh, it's called as, uh, you know, it's labeled as a 12 month appropriated money. Well, of course, that's assuming you had a, a appropriation at the start of your fiscal year, which at least in the few years that I've been here, I don't believe we've had any fiscal year start where we had the full 12 year appropriations, you know, made available to us because of chain, uh, uh, continuous resolutions. And so what that means is you even have less than a 12 month window to use the allocated budgets there. And so that creates its own nuances. So let me kind of talk about some of the ways that we are trying to address these uh, challenges from a budget standpoint. So first and foremost, I talked about the self-funding model. But again, I want to point out that the self-funding model by itself is not an endless pitch, so to speak, because once you realize those cost savings opportunities, then there is not much more to go and chase them any further. So yes, you can initially get uh, some cost savings uh, from those contracts and maintenance contracts, right sizing. But once you have done that, that opportunity will no longer have the, the same impact as you did initially. Second is, you know, leveraging other funding sources like the IT Working Capital Fund. I just want to point out that SBA is one of the first agencies which under the MJT Act was able to uh, get the IT Working Capital Fund created. What that does is high level, it allows the CFO and the CIO to be able to sweep up money at the end of a fiscal year, which has not been used and direct it into this IT Working Capital Fund, making it in essence a three-year money pool in which you can use for modernization or the Technology Modernization Fund, or um, you know, within GSA, they have the Technology Transformation Services or TTS, and sometimes they also have some funding. So what I'm trying to say is that you know, uh, leveraging any or all of these funding sources that might be available to you. And last but not the least is obviously working with your congressional budget justification process to see if you can uh, try and make a good case to see how your uh, budget app appropriations could be increased. Now, in the dimension of contracting and acquisitions, I have to say, this is a really tough one. I think one of the key challenges in the contracting acquisition process is, you know, increasingly, the IT world is moving into what I call is a consumption-based model. So you're no longer buying like servers and equipment or discrete pieces of equipment. And in a consumption-based model, it's not easy to determine how much you will consume in a given period of time. So you project that and then you make the uh, acquisition against that. So I think just to net out three management challenges around people, around budgets and contracting and acquisition. Sanjay, uh, technology plays an integral role in how the Small Business Administration meets its very important mission. Uh, to that end, would you tell us more about SBA's technology strategies and perhaps you could offer us some of your key priorities? Absolutely. So one of the things I should, I want to start with by saying is the COVID-19 global pandemic has brought about a new recognition of the critical role IT or information technology plays 
for the mission delivery. And it, is, it doesn't matter if you're in the public sector, private sector, academia, uh, not-for-profit, uh, and you could be anywhere in the globe. So organizations that had invested in modern technologies before the pandemic were in a far better position to respond to the changes brought about by the pandemic, such as you know virtual work environments, like pretty much everywhere across the globe, people immediately went into a virtual work environment. And so what we saw, even at the SBA, is a difference. So areas where we had modern solutions in place already, we were able to pivot quickly there versus the areas that we were not as modern and we're using traditional technologies. So in terms of the technology strategy for the SBA, it's fundamentally founded in the SBA mission and the business needs and the business goals that we're trying to achieve. At the highest level, I would say it's about delivering improved citizen services. It's allowing the use of things like automation or technology like artificial intelligence and machine learning that makes value-added work more important for the SBA workforce as opposed to the mundane work. It's about increasing the reliance on data and facts to drive policymaking and decision-making. So we're using data increasingly, and that is informing our decision-making processes. And I should also point out that the SBA administrator has three priorities. And one of our three priorities is about technology-led and technology-driven. So in that sense, it has given us a new impetus to be able to examine everything we do at the SBA from that technology-driven or technology-led lens to see how can we now improve it, enhance it, or increase the effectiveness of the productivity of that program. So in that sense, I think we are uh, well-positioned. One final point I want to make on this is that, and this is just my observation, that I think as a federal IT environment, we do need to increase the focus on innovation. And the reason I say that is, if you look at the total annual IT spend across the large federal landscape, that's a significantly large number. And I think we can spur more innovation. I think we can spur more collaborations and partnerships across the agencies so that we can learn from each other and also join forces and solve common problems that I think a lot of the agencies are facing. That's terrific. You know, I'd like to transition right into some of the initiatives that you've been pursuing, and in particular, modernization. Uh, uh, can we explore how you're modernizing infrastructure and systems? And where I'm going with this is perhaps you could tell us more about SBA's cloud journey and cloud migration efforts. But what are some of the benefits and key challenges to moving to the cloud? Certainly. And like I was saying earlier, Michael, uh, I had the opportunity to launch the SBA cloud initiative in spring of 2017. Uh, I, I, I realized very quickly that uh, there was a confluence of events at the SBA at that point in time. Our primary data center had all kinds of um, challenges in terms of aging, out-of-date equipment, uh, overheating in the data center, uh, and few other environmental challenges. And obviously, there was a reliability issue in terms of being able to provide some even basic uh, IT services in a reliable fashion. So having had experience with cloud uh, previously and, and knowing the, the benefits, and I'll come, out, come and cover some of the benefits here shortly, led this cloud initiative, which I talked about earlier, again, 82 calendar days. Again, mind you, these are not business days, calendar days to, to get us from no cloud to a design architecture and a migration plan to that, and which ultimately led us to uh, immediately in the fall of 17, you know, realize the value that the cloud foundation had helped us you know, build. I want to point out that while there may have been some cost savings and cost avoidance opportunities, in our disaster response. But to me, the most important part was the time saving we had and the acceleration we had in our disaster response uh, couldn't have been achieved had we gone the traditional route of acquiring more hardware and, and, and going through the whole cycle of that. Uh, again, that Cloud Foundation has provided SBA a tremendous ability to scale up exponentially uh, to respond to the, the COVID-19 pandemic response here. There are three key benefits, and there's probably more to it, but first and foremost, it is speed to execute. And because in the traditional model, if you think about it, you know, you had to go and acquire hardware, acquire software, do the installations, configure it, and now you're in a position to start, quote unquote, building a solution for the business, right? 
And this upfront time sometimes took long and they were long cycles. And especially in the federal government, the, the contracting acquisition process is the contracting acquisition process and it takes the time it takes. So now if you already have a footprint in the cloud, your ability to start building that business solution is now probably reduced to hours and no longer months or quarters. So that is to me the single most important aspect of the benefit of having a cloud. The second one is obviously, which comes with the cloud's inherent nature is the ability to scale up and scale down based on demand. And I think, especially in the SVA instance where our mission includes disaster systems, which is unpredictable, because natural disasters, yes, we may have some idea, you know, this is the hurricane season, for example, that we are under right now as we're speaking. So yes, we are likely to have more hurricanes during this period of the year, but we cannot necessarily predict how many and how hard and how what category those hurricanes will be and if they'll have a landfall as well, right? What might be the potential impact? So the nature of a business requires us to be flexible and be able to address those changes in the business demands in a quick manner. So that's the sort of the second aspect of it. The third aspect I would say is from a purely financial management standpoint. So it allows us to move away from a CapEx model to an OpEx model. And that I think is a really critical aspect because it takes us away from the cyclical investment cycles where every three, five, seven years, whenever you needed to refresh your hardware, you had a huge spike in your capital spending and then you waited for the next cycle to happen. And so that cycle continued on uh, and, and, and that never was a um, uh, easy discussion with the CFO when you needed to do the, the major tech refresh. So, so those are some of the, the, key, the challenges, uh, the, the benefits. There's also probably a couple of challenges I think, I think in, in balance I wanna talk about. First off, it's a mind shift, shift, mindset shift. It's a paradigm change going to a consumption model because traditionally we've been used to, you know, buying a hardware asset or server, and then you basically now have the full asset uh, available to you for the life of the asset. So you're not necessarily paying much more than the sort of the electricity cost or the cooling cost to run that, uh, the server now. Now, given that this is a consumption-based model, you have to look at it in just sort of what I call is like a utility at your home. It's like a light switch. When you turn it on, your, your bill starts on, and when you turn it off, your bill is off now. So, so that's a, a shift in the way you think about these assets. There's also change management processes. Like for example, if you had change management processes that took months and, or weeks to go through a change, now in the cloud environment, you can potentially have those changes you know, within a day or sometimes multiple times during a day. So you have to change your processes there. The second aspect is you need a workforce that has an understanding of what the cloud computing model is about. And you have to know that fundamentally to be able to leverage the examples. So example, I'll just give you a very high level perspective on that. So usually, regardless of which cloud service provider you're using, there are two ways in which you consume the cloud. One is what I call is a pay-as-you-go model or a pre-committed model. And on the face of it, one may not necessarily think too much about it, if you think about it closely, and if you understand the pre-committed model, you decide on a pre-configured um, um, cloud resource that you want to consume, and you make a commitment, say, over a year, two years, or three years, and you get a discounted price for consuming that cloud resource, versus if you were going to consume the same resource for the same amount and for the same capacity over the two-year period of time, you could be from a cost standpoint, more than 50% cheaper in the pre-committed model versus the pay-as-you-go model. Mind you, you're consuming the same sources or resources, but just that how you set them up. So this is one just example to illustrate the fact that the people who are the workforce that are driving the use of your cloud resources, you have to have a really good understanding and be able to leverage these benefits when you can. So Sanjay, uh, the cyber attack profile since uh, every agency almost has gone remote has increased exponentially. 
Given the evolving nature of the cyber threats agencies face, would you elaborate on your efforts to enhance technology security across the enterprise at SBA? And perhaps you can tell us how do tools such as trusted internet connection efforts, CDM, and machine learning factor in to your efforts to enhance SBA's cybersecurity posture? The vision I laid out was very simple. The simple vision is we need to have a singular way to manage, monitor, secure all IT assets in SBA. And what that means is if the asset is a mobile asset, if the mobile asset is a virtual asset, if the asset is a physical asset, uh, it does not matter. If it is a cloud-based asset, if it's in purple colored cloud versus orange colored cloud, it does not matter. We look at all IT assets in a uniform way, in a singular fashion. And by the way, I deployed tools in a cloud environment, which allowed us to manage, monitor, track, and secure all IT assets in this sort of uniform way. Now, I want to point out, this is not one single tool, it's a collection of tools, uh, and, and they come from many sources. But the idea is that we have a singular way to manage, monitor, track, and secure all IT assets. What that has done is, back in 2017, 18, it gave us immense visibility into the entire SBA IT environment. And quite frankly, what it did was that as people moved into the virtual work environment, a lot of the agencies faced the challenge of saying, well, you're no longer on an agency network, so I don't know how to protect you. In our case, quite frankly, that did not really make much of a difference for the simple fact that the way I had set this up back in 2017 and 2018, it did not matter where the individual or the endpoint, as we say, was located where they were connecting from, meaning if they were outside an agency network in, 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 in the last year and a half, everybody's been working remotely. So very few people, if you will, are connecting from an agency location or the agency network. So they're connecting over the internet. So we had the full visibility because of that setup. And that has allowed us to maintain the cybersecurity posture given uh, the, the increased nature of our work here. And obviously, you know, given the fact that we're processing over a trillion dollars, that has obviously, uh, you know, attracted more attention than we would probably have desired as well, right? Now, in terms of, let me give you some examples of how we did this and what, what kind of things, some simple solutions that I put in place. And, and you mentioned about AI ML, and I'll talk about the tick and the CDM as well in just a minute as well, is that, for example, geofencing. Uh, so in March 2020, I realized that these economic recovery initiatives were focused on the continental United States. So working with my CISO, the chief information security officer, then I said, look, let's just implement geofencing. What that does is it blocks traffic, network traffic to be more specific, that originates outside the continental United States. So for simple fact, we implemented this and we put this all across all of our portals. So we had you know, basically blocked any traffic that was network traffic that was raining outside the United continental United States. We implemented things like conditional access. Now, what that means is it takes a series of conditions into account, meaning where the traffic is originating from, meaning a person's uh, home office or let's say a shade uh, space if they're working in, let's say, a coffee shop or some other location where there's a shade public uh, Wi-Fi that they might be using. Uh, so, so you associate a reputation score for that IP address from where that traffic is originating. You associate a risk profile of the user, which again, I'll talk about just in a minute about how we build you know, user profiles in an automated manner through the tools. And then you put in a variety of other combinations of signals like uh, the, the vulnerability level of the endpoint that they're using uh, or the patch levels and so on and so forth. And that goes into a dynamic engine which determines the level of access the individual should be granted given those input signals. And so, so this conditional access is one of those capabilities we had turned on and accelerated the use of uh, during the pandemic. This was something which we had implemented earlier, but we had not necessarily seen an, an advanced uptake of the use of this. Granted, most people were you know, working from an SBA location. So these are some examples of how we were able to overcome the, the challenges that most of the agencies have faced. Now, in terms of the, the AI MLUs, I'd mentioned earlier that from a cybersecurity standpoint, uh, the tools that I'd implemented gave us what I call our anomaly detection capabilities. And let me give some very quick examples of that. First and foremost, so for example, uh, I log in and my login shows coming from Washington, D.C., let's say at 8 a.m. Eastern. 
And let's just say at 9 a.m. Eastern, it shows I'm logging in from Los Angeles, California. Now, clearly, I could not have been in Washington, D.C. at 8 a.m. Eastern and at 9 a.m. Eastern being in Los Angeles, California in 60 minutes duration. So what that would have done is it would have flagged an alert for a security operations team to look and say, improbable travel alert, saying, me as an individual could not physically have gone from the East Coast to the West Coast in 60 minutes apart. And so they would look into that and, and, and be able to find out if there was something you know, in, in nefarious going on or it was just a false alert as an example. And so some of these capabilities are built into the tools and we had turned on these capabilities early on and that allowed us to see how the traffic was originating and user profiles that were built in an automated fashion and they generated alerts based on the pattern of the users. When I set this vision and implemented the vision, the two things amongst other things it did was it allowed us to meet the, the tech requirements, but it also allowed us to meet the CDM or the continuous diagnostics and mitigation program requirements. It allowed us to showcase, you know, working with, you know, in this case, um, DHS team to say that we could achieve the objectives or the goals of the programs without necessarily adopting the, the, the prescribed architecture by those programs. And that's been a huge thing. Uh, and, and it's also allowed OMB to you know, issue new guidance like the PIC 3.0 policy that came out in December of 2019. Uh, and that has been a huge uh, uh, asset uh, for all agencies, quite frankly, uh, and especially in the last year and a half. So Sanjay, uh, would you outline SBA's digital transformation strategy? What are the core pillars of the strategy? And perhaps you could you could give us an update of the progress in this area. Yeah, definitely, definitely. And and I think really comes down to three key elements. First and foremost, it starts with what I call is customer experience, or in our case, citizen experiences. And I'll expound on that and give some examples of what that is. The second is what I call is digital only workflows. And the third and the most important aspect of this is data. We need to emphasize, I know we're all technologists talking about technology, but we cannot lose sight of the fact that technology is an enabler of the mission, which is ultimately serving our citizens or customers, whichever way you want to think about it. So that's why I start by saying any digital transformation we're talking about has to be founded in what is it doing to improve the overall citizen slash customer experience. And you have to look at it from a customer lens first and foremost. And yes, you know, there will be some benefits that the internal organization will also accrue by the digital transformation, but certainly you have to start with the customer aspect first. So let me give you some examples from, from what does that mean? So if you're talking about customer experiences, and at least I'll give you an XB example is, you know, back in 2017, uh, the way we were set up was, uh, our customers, as they interact with the different various program offices, each program office, you know, using a siloed approach, used to talk to the individual and kind of, you know, each one probably had them create a user ID and a password and then, you know, work with that. But yet they were the same individual, but just because the way it was siloed, uh, they, they ended up creating multiple user IDs and passwords with each program office. So early on in 2017, I implemented the notion of an enterprise single sign-on with the intent to say, we need to improve our customer experience and we should not ask the customer to create multiple user IDs and passwords and create profiles multiple times. We should be able to create it once and allow them to be able to share it across their various program offices. So we started with that back in 17 and we continue to make progress in that dimension. And yes, it's still continuing. It's a journey, it's not necessarily complete. But you know, we implemented things like multi-factor authorization, MFA, uh, in the single sign-on service, so that allows the customer to have uh, an increased uh, you know, reliability and, and an increased confidence from a security standpoint, right? You know, when we launched new customer-facing applications, one of the things I set up as a principle was that these need to be responsibly designed. What that means is simply is they needed to be mobile-friendly applications. And so, so it's no different in the public sector as well, where increasingly the citizens are using mobile devices like a smartphone or a tablet to access the, those resources by the agency. Let me talk about digital workflows now, and I'll, I'll try and make this quick as well. When you make a digital-only process, you allow the user interface to collect that information in an interactive manner or allow people to also upload documents to support it, but that, that's sort of how you collect it 
and you create a, a user interface which allows you to only collect the information that you really need to use to process that information or that application for that matter. Let me hit on the data aspect of it, right? Data is the currency of the digital world. And what that means is in today's digital world, we should be looking at data as an asset and we should be managing it as an asset. And I think in the federal government, we are sitting on a treasure trove of data that is of immense value, both in, you know, in the public sector as well as a private sector. I know we talk about using things like artificial intelligence and machine learning, but guess what? They are founded on a strong data foundation, training data or data is what they're working with to be able to you know, create informed choices and informed decisions, right? So again, so there's a whole aspect of this. So from an, from an SBA standpoint, around these three dimensions, we've been making progress uh, in, the, in the area of being able to improve our customer experiences. We have many initiatives going around in that, and we continue to make progress in that. Certainly in the digital-only workflows and, and providing better uh, user experiences as a, as a user interact with us. And then of course, on the data domain as well, um, I would say that, you know, um, the progress could be faster, but, you know, given constraints we work with, I think it's still going, um, but, but certainly I would hope we could move faster in that domain. This has been the Business of Government Hour, a conversation with Sanjay Gupta, Chief Technology Officer at the Small Business Administration, SBA. Be sure to join us next time for another informative, insightful, and in-depth conversation on improving government leadership and its effectiveness. Until then, subscribe, download, and listen to the entire interview at Podcast One, iTunes, or on your favorite podcast app, and as always at businessofgovernment.org.